Today, more than 4 billion people around the world use the internet. But not all people enjoy it the same way. In 2019, global internet freedom declined for the ninth consecutive year due to various restrictions. About 33 countries switched their internet off, impacting freedom of expression for their citizens. Such practices cost them nearly $8 billion every year. To create more inclusive, free and prosperous societies, we need to close this gap. Thank you for joining us for another keynote during the Closing the Gap conference. I'm very happy to have with us today Karuna Nundi, who is the advocate at the Supreme Court of India, and who we're very happy to have with us because over the past years in her career, she has covered a lot of high level cases uh, in India, but also built up her career by providing advice to different governments, civil society organizations, and doing pro bono work. I think, uh, Karuna, I will not exaggerate if I say that in the um, legal world in India, you are considered a bit of a rock star. Uh... <laughs> Or at least that's 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 that, that's how I how I perceive you. Uh, we have known each other for many years. Uh, we've been trying to get Karuna to many of different events that we have organized in New Delhi or here, uh, but her busy agenda and saving the world and providing justice uh, in India is much more co much more important in our events. So I'm very happy that this is happening right now. Uh, thank you, Karuna, for joining us. What we've decided to talk about today uh, is the broad idea of closing the freedom gap. And we have presented the short animation about uh, freedom of speech and freedom online, which is something that uh, you've also uh, addressed very broadly uh, throughout your um, career as, as a lawyer. Uh, but I also know that we're going to discuss a bit more uh, other freedoms and gaps that exist uh, nowadays. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to give you the floor and uh, look forward to your uh, keynote speech. And we can continue afterwards with um, uh, questions from the audience and have maybe a short conversation uh, if you don't mind. So uh, for those who are watching us, please use the Q&A uh, tag in your, uh, in your screen to pose questions and comments that you might have. Karuna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Patrick, and uh, for the warm introduction. And I am delighted to be here because I think this is an extremely important time. And um, the reason it's an extremely important time is that while we are imprisoned in our homes, in our workplaces, there is a rise of people being sent to actual prisons. There's a rise of authoritarianism. And I think that rise is because of a few reasons. Um, whether it is in China with the re recent clampdown on national security in Hong Kong, whether it is in India with the extension of the UAPA law, which is the essentially the anti-terrorist law, and extending it to acts of speech that are against government, essentially. Uh, not even the overthrow of the state, which is sort of the more traditional idea of sedition, but now speech that is against government. And uh, in many countries, those the, the anti-fake news laws, right? Um, I think these, this extension of authoritarianism is happening in a context that the bandwidth of resistance has reduced dramatically. Now, why do I say that? I say that because access to justice and access to courts uh, has reduced dramatically in many, many countries. And the reason, of course, is COVID. Because I mean, one, one of the big reasons, shall we say, is because of COVID. Because typically, judges across the world are men um, and they are elderly men. And they're elderly, elderly men we are particularly concerned about because they are the most vulnerable to this disease. Um, and they are the most concerned about this also. Um, 
I think what has also happened is because of this personal and individual concern, of course, there has there have been these safety mechanisms have been put in place. But quite apart from that, there is also a deference to government, whether it is from the larger populace that wants strong and authoritative protection from this disease, but also I think from um, the judiciary that uh, judiciaries rather that feel that they must defer to those who are leading the protection effort because possibly they feel that they don't have the bandwidth, that this is not the time to speak about and protect rights. Now, the problem is, is that times of emergency in times of emergency there is a ratchet effect and that ratchet effect is that laws get extended and then they generally don't get rolled back and indeed it is in times of emergency that basic rights are even more important you know we need to know for instance whether government's data is being fudged or whether the way government says people are being protected is, is true. We need to know whether the people who are being arrested for acts of speech online are getting due process. We need, we need media to report on that. We need to know that a purported act of terrorism, whether it is an act of terrorism or not, so transparency is something that is, is extremely important. Um, in the absence of physical protest. Now, of course, this is a completely sui generis, unprecedented, um, bizarre time, right? I mean, to throw lots of adjectives together. But, um, but when I speak of the bandwidth of the resistance reducing, I also speak of the lack of ability of people to come out onto the streets. And then given the clampdown on speech online also, the, the protests online is something that, even then that is being limited too with the expansion of their terror laws that, um, you know, we have a problem here. Now, when we think about what's going on in the United States, and there has been a huge criticism of liberalism, now, I don't know about you, and there are a lot of people, I, um, friends and family that I love and respect who are liberals. I am not. Um, and I think that there is an identification of the problems with liberalism that have emerged, for example, from the Harper's letter. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. If you're not, let's have a discussion about that later. And the economists. Um, that spoke essentially in a critique of cancel culture. Uh, an opinion editor of the U uh, New York Times resigned because she said that there was a backlash from her colleagues about the opinion piece from a serious right winger that was published in the, in the pages of the New York Times that was then subsequently taken down as not meeting its standards, right? Many of these um, opinion pieces, whether it's from Harper's, whether it's from the, uh, the Economic Times, were critiques of cancel culture. Now, if cancel culture is essentially the internet and progressives on the internet, progressives and radicals on the internet, saying that you are no longer to be heard and no longer relevant because you have said something that is racist or in J.K. Rowling's case, transphobic, or in other, you know, similarly. These large and powerful organizations spoke of their critique of cancel culture. Now, the point is, I think, in that in the context that I spoke about earlier, power doesn't reside with trans people. The power to speak and the access to platforms doesn't primarily reside with black people or with women. So let's be clear that when we speak of white 
right wingers or liberals suffering from the ills of cancel culture. Let us be clear that everyone else, right, in those societies, and in my society, we, you know, there are sort of upper caste people like me uh, have, have that privilege. Um, but others, uh, you know, so called lower caste people, black people, the lower caste across the world, because this is a global problem, are worried about being killed or are worried about wrongly being wrongly arrested or are worried about being disproportionately imprisoned. So I think the point, the learning from BLM, from Black Lives Matter across the world must be that issues of access, and I think issues of access have become that much more important during the pandemic, and that, that'll be the third set of points that I would like to address, um, are that much more vital. Who speaks rather than who is spoken for is something that we have to keep revisiting every day. Passing the mic, sharing the, sharing the space, making structural changes within organizations and testing our policies, our cases, our um, litigations against the most disadvantaged people, person in our mind's eye. This is, what, this is what Mahatma Gandhi said, is that whenever I do something, I think of the most disadvantaged person. And that is when I take action. Um, when we speak of access also, it's never true, truer than it is now that access to the internet, which although it has increased hugely across the world, is still uh, gendered. There are far, far more men than there are women. In fact, a big reason that women are explicitly denied access is because it leads to power, right? It's because it leads to love outside arranged marriages. It's because um, the internet can lead to financial empowerment. I'm currently representing in court a fintech company called Paytm, which has 330 million users in India. And if you have access to what is effectively a bank, and actually one of the one of the companies is a payment bank, on your phone, and if you have a, the ability to access a fair finance mechanism, because otherwise interest rates by loan shark, for example, are matter, for example, uh, are matter. access to money, you know, at all for a bank, um, then I think that your ability, your power, your ability to speak, your ability to work, your ability to express yourselves, express the core of your being in a variety of ways is something that is enhanced and expanded. Um, with regard to access online, voice enabling of the internet and access to being able to use an IVR sort of menu, a voice recorded sort of menu, to be able to access the internet. So for example, in Kenya, Rwanda, in, uh, which is a language in Rwanda, there was a effort and there was sort of innovation experimentation going on to, in Kenya, Rwanda, be able to activate, uh, 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 to, uh, to activate various websites online and to be able to get information, voice operated information in return. Right, and I think that that uh, innovation has extended, but it's not nearly it's not extended nearly enough. Much of the global dominance of the World Wide Web continues to be in English. So we have a lot of mechanisms are unlocked. The potential to learn to um, open up the world is tremendous. How do we close the gap? While we are, you know, sweeping our houses and homeschooling our children, I think that the bandwidth of rights must be organized and furthered. Litigation is not dead. It just has to be much, much more strategic. Organizing online is most people's attention is online. So 
organizing online has to pivot and take advantage of better strategizing and a new world. And I think a very close eye has to be kept on the freedoms that are being rolled back as we speak. Because unless we act to push the arc of moral justice, and the moral universe rather, towards justice, it's not going to go there in our lifetime. Thank you. Great, Karuna. Thank you very much for, for these remarks. I can already see a few hashtags probably popping up, you know, bandwidth, bandwidth to resist, uh, and also cancel culture that you were talking about. Um, I, I think this was a really very important voice during the week that uh, we're in trying to close the gap in many different dimensions. Uh, you've mentioned access to justice. We had yesterday the session on closing the international law gap. Uh, tomorrow we're going to have another keynote that focuses exactly on closing the gender gap. And we continue with uh, other keynotes devoted to a geographical gap or diversity gap on uh, in cyberspace. So I think all these elements that you put on the uh, on the table are really very important. Um, and where I think the value of this intervention also comes in our thinking is that we had got so used to talking about, especially in the world of cyber diplomacy, uh, about how it stands for uh, open, free, secure, accessible um, cyberspace. And whenever you ask people, what does that actually mean? And uh, nobody really has the answer. Well, I think your speech actually provides the answer to the question of what does open, free and accessible uh, uh, access to internet mean. Now, um, you mentioned you mentioned a few very interesting things that also resonate, I think, not only in India, but also here in Europe and probably also in the United States, uh, which is this access to uh, access to justice and, uh, and courts during the COVID-19. Uh, and there you really stressed um, the sort of a structural gender dimension as well that kind of underpins uh, the situation in uh, in India and this need for um, us to monitor actually this uh, rolling back of the emergency uh, rules that are being uh, that are being imposed uh, all across uh, all across the world. Um, I was wondering whether you could give us any feeling of um, what is it that we should be keeping an eye on? You know, when we think about potential red lights uh, when it comes to uh, scaling back those emergency measures. Uh, what do you think, where, where do you think we should be getting worried, you know, uh, with our conversations uh, with some of the European Union officials, uh, of course, uh, this issue of uh, scaling back on emergency laws comes back, um, comes very quickly and everybody keeps repeating that those measures uh, are only temporary, uh, but as you have also indicated, that is actually hardly ever the case. And in Europe, for instance, we have already seen instances when uh, people uh, went through the deconfinement measures, and then when the governments tried to impose confinement measures again, there was some so some resistance, as you were uh, as you were calling it. So to, to so how do we actually you know draw also this line between um, the freedom to express ourselves, to move, to leave, uh, but also this uh, kind of a negative freedom where we also have the obligation actually to protect others from, um, from the potential harm, because it seems to me that none of these is really um, an absolute in itself. So from your legal experience, where, where would you draw the line? You know, where, where, where do we have to uh, think about ourselves as um, and the society? Where do we, uh, where do we kind of cut the protection of uh, the society from the healthcare perspective, but also countering it with, um, uh, with access to justice and our freedoms of expression and uh, other liberties? Well, that's a really interesting question, Patrick. And uh, I was sort of, you know, the advantage of being at my desk <laughs> instead of on a podium is that I can quickly look things up. Now, I was looking at the, the, uh, the European Commission High Level Group final report on misinformation. The very interesting thing about that is that the conclusion that uh, came was that it 
there shouldn't, in fact, be laws against fake news, not regulating against misinformation, you know. And um, in the uh, Global Columbia Experts Free Speech Committee, we've been talking about fake news for a while. Because, of course, this is a massive problem. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And um, if anything, I mean, whether we look at sort of uh, the Russian government on Facebook, whether we look at sort of the stormtroopers of various right-wing parties unleashing, um, you know, their uh, through purported proxies, right? All sorts of fake news about... Um, political opponents or, you know, fake news to support their government. This has been a problem for a long time. So when I say that at the moment we haven't hit on a way to regulate it, that is in proportionate, necessary, and, um, you know, meets those very important legal standards um, and well-tailored. Um, it is, it is with some regret, <laughs> regret. COVID, of course, the fake news issue becomes that much more important because uh, spreading panic, while people don't have that many other ways of access, uh, accessing information, where people are hooked onto their phones, that are hooked onto the, their computers as reliable sources of information, right? Um, and whether it's WhatsApp forwards or anything else. Now, what's happening, though, is that in the guise of cracking down of fake news. Governments are cracking down on, and this was always the apprehension, a lot of governments are cracking down on speech they don't like, right? Whether it's a critique of government action in these difficult times, or whether government itself in general um, from Brazil to South Korea. So these efforts are raising questions as, about infringing free speech guarantees. Whether it's in the, uh, you know, whether it's journalists being arrested in my city for objective journalism. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, I think these are uh, uh, there are questions, there are sort of very important concerns about um, fake news being used and, as an excuse. And I am concerned that this is something that will not be rolled back very easily at all. When we speak of what's going on in Hong Kong and the ability to have in-camera trials for anti-government speech, that is then, you know, has the potential to be uh, labeled terrorist speech. Mm -hmm. Or whether we look at the UAPA, which is the main anti-terror law now in India, and the extend, extending that during lockdown, and the fact that the burden of proof in some cases is actually reversed under that law, and that jail becomes the rule for the trial rather than bail, see, is, is something that is of, is, is of great concern. So I think the worry is that under cover of purported safety, there is a lot that is happening to limit the safety of people who speak and to take it away altogether in some cases. So when we say that this is for safety, I think the question we should ask is safety for who? Um, I think there's a problem. Somebody stop my video. My mistake. Yes. Uh it's it's breaking a lot. I won't, I'm told, so we have stopped it for the moment to see if it reestablishes itself. Okay, so we, we we can switch it on again, and hopefully it's going to uh, be better now. Perfect. Yeah. So I think the question that we have have to ask is safety for who? Um, 
in the what is still the big online free speech case that some of us litigated and uh, i was arguing for the largest civil liberties organization in the world and we were asking for reasons to be given and transparency when websites are blocked and for anyone who is a recipient of information to have the locus to go and challenge the blocking of a website and when we were saying that in we shouldn't have the affirmative obligation on something that is insulting, you know, or and where insulting is not defined anywhere, or blasphemous. Um, and also to strike down as unconstitutional Section 66A, which was the provision that at its lowest threshold criminalized speech that was annoying or inconvenient. I think it became clear even at the time that um there is a fear of the internet. There's a fear of the wild west, of the, of the wildness of the internet. Um, and that is when we speak of, you know, sovereign governments. But of course, when we speak of large uh, big tech and we look at the profit incentive in not regulating hate speech, in not looking at rape threats and death threats, in... Um, I think the EU has had the most positive role in this regard, actually, because they tend to ignore developing country concerns, and they tend to of a positive effect on such issues. So I think the EU, you know, whether it's the GDPR for privacy, whether it is um, whether it's your proposed council that's going to look at algorithms, which is the bottom floor at which human rights get determined, you know, and, you know, in the next five years, we're going to see machines taking over very, very important functions. Um, I think that this oversight is important. I think the EU as a leader of regulation, cyber regulation, has a significant role to play in this regard. Great, Karuna. Thank you very much. I have also one question um, uh, for one for, from our viewers, and I'm going to read it. I must admit, I'm not familiar with the case myself, so hopefully I'm not going to distort anything. But um, uh, the question is, as Kashmir is going to complete almost one year without 4G internet connection, what do you think of this issue creating a huge freedom gap in this pandemic um, in reference to the Anuranda Basin ruling? Thank you. And Karuna, uh, may, you know, maybe we're going to switch off your uh, video because I think the audio is better without uh, without the image, and we'll reconnect after the answer uh, just to uh, just to conclude. Is that fine with you? Absolutely. Great. I think it's a huge problem because now, as the world goes online and so for example as bids are made online for government contracts we saw recently it was much harder for Kashmiris to make these bids for these government contracts uh, for work in their own state because their internet was much slower where they had access in the rare places that they had access. since information to uh, COVID is linked um, that's a problem. The freedom gap in Kashmir, I think, has extended hugely. Now, I mean, there is a Supreme Court judgment, as I'm sure perhaps the questioner is aware. There is a Supreme Court judgment requiring the government, uh, you know, saying that these internet shutdowns are illegal, disproportionate, etc. But then ultimately requiring um, the government to consider its own decision. Which is, as we say, you know, as we say in the law here, is that the operation might be successful, but the patient's dead, right? So there's not much point asking the government to sort of think about whether what it did was right or not, when um, they're saying that for future cases, this would certainly be wrong. So I think the freedom gap in Kashmir has extended significantly. Great, Karuna. 
we're going to switch your video back on just to uh, just to conclude. I also know it's uh, much later where you are than here in Brussels, so I don't want to uh, abuse your kindness. Thank you very much for joining us for this and for sharing your views. I think um, the most important lessons for me from this conversation is also that actually many issues that we think actually are quite local and concern only us are at the end of the day quite universal. Many of the uh, many of the aspects that you have highlighted, uh, you know, I was taking my notes and thinking already in my head how uh, or how many connections there are to the discussions and debates we're having uh, currently in Europe. And I think that also really stresses this importance of uh, us making the effort to try to connect different communities, but also different regions, because at the end of the day, we're all dealing with similar problems and the answers to those can be only um, common. Thank you for highlighting also the role of the European Union in India. Uh, today actually uh, was the day of an EU-India uh, summit where I saw we had a recommitment of both sides to a dialogue on uh, human rights. As you said, let, let's see uh, how all these declarations will work out in practice. Uh, but at least we have a commitment on the paper. And as you said, hopefully the patient is not dead in that specific case. Uh, despite uh, things being on the paper, uh, hopefully they also will be implemented in practice. Uh, Karuna, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us uh, and sharing your thoughts. This video will be later available on demand as well. Uh, so hopefully uh, people will be able to rewatch it later as well. And as I've mentioned initially, we're going to have tomorrow morning another session that focuses exactly on closing the gender gap. And over the next two days, one devoted to diversity and geographical gaps. So I'm sure many of the aspects that you have flagged are also going to come up. But for now, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to those who are uh, watching us and listening. And we look forward to continuing the conversation with you in the coming days. And Karuna, good night to you and thanks and good luck with your job. Thanks a lot.